Good morning. morning. Oh, that was nice. (laughs) It's nice to hear a good resounding good morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. Obviously, I am not Zach Bay, although I can have on good authority an update on him for those of you who have asked so much. You can wave at the camera because he's watching online. So the choir can all wave. There we go. He's doing really well. Uh, We went and saw the doctor on Friday, got a good report. He does have to be in the sling for three more weeks. Um, And he starts physical therapy this week. So continue to pray for that journey for him and for the fact that he may or may not be going a little stir crazy. Um, So those of you that know him well know it's a little hard to sit still for this long. Um, But he is doing well and we thank Thank you all for all of the wonderful ways that you have taken care of us during this time. We really appreciate it. All the calls and food and everything that everyone has done. We are very thankful. If you take your worship guide and flip to the back and look at our announcements for the week, you'll want to note that today is our church picnic at six o'clock over at Bartlett Park. We hope you can all come, bring your family, bring your friends, bring a lawn chair. There'll be plenty of food and hopefully it'll be a little cooler starting at six o'clock. So you'll wanna come out for that. This week, Wednesday night, same old, same old, what we usually do, so plan to be here for that as well. And then I would like to draw your attention to a special announcement on September 29th. We're offering a road trip to see the Smoky Mountain Opry in Sevierville, Tennessee. So the performance will be at eight, tickets are $35, and the bus will leave here at 3 p.m. And we'll also eat dinner before the show. So if you would like to join First Baptist in that, there's a sign-up sheet on the door outside the fellowship hall. We'd love to have you come and join us. We do have a limited amount of tickets, so make sure you sign up ASAP. Today in worship, we're continuing to sometimes somewhat slog through the prophets, and we will continue with Jeremiah in worship. But I encourage you to listen to both the Jeremiah text and the gospel lesson, as you will hear some similarities, and the sermon will hopefully weave those two texts together. But on our way to that, I invite you to stand and hug the neck of someone close by and say you're glad they're here.
Praise the Lord who reigns above. Our hymn of praise is 334 as we stand together and raise our voices. to you, our creator, and we give thanks to you, our redeemer. We ask you, God, to be here in this place with us. Surround us with your love. Hold us in our grief. Rejoice with us in our good news. We bring praise to you and ask you to call us to the service where we can show your love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you read with me together the litany of invitation and confession in your bulletin? God invites us to mutual love, but to find that mutuality, we must release our desire for privilege. God calls us to service rather than honor. We confess that we often exalt ourselves and mock the humble. God calls us to love the unknown rather than simply the familiar. We confess that we choose to believe we are self-sufficient rather than trust in your strength. God calls us to worship rather than mindless routine. Sisters and brothers, God rejoices when we repent and return. Rejoice, for you have been reconciled to God and to one another. Let us lift our voices in thanks and praise to God. God's people for turning to flashy gimmicks rather than the good news. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me and went after worthless things and became worthless themselves? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, 
who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives. I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests didn't say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that hold no water. Here ends the first lesson. and say our prayers together. Living God, sometimes we come before you and we're overflowing with joy. On some days we come and we're certain of your blessings and your presence in our lives. But other times, God, we come before you as wanderers in the desert, questioning your silence, and your distance as our world seems to come apart at the seams. But God, we know that even in the midst of our great struggles, you are there. And Lord, we also know that in the midst of overflowing joy, you are there too. So walk with us, God. Guide us and teach us and mold us. And Lord, this morning we pray especially for all those around the world who are hurting and suffering. We remember, God, those in Italy who have lost everything to an earthquake. We remember those who are fleeing for their lives from war-torn countries. And God, we pray for those who are hurting in our own country. We remember those who have lost everything to flooding in Louisiana. And God, we pray for those in our community and even in this very room. We remember those who are reeling still from the loss of a loved one. We remember those who are sick and those who are healing. We remember those who are hurting and worried and anxious. And God, we're thankful for those who are joyful. 
And through it all, Lord, be with us. Teach us to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. As we say together boldly and in one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy life is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our prayer response, number 652. Will you sing with me, Make Me a Servant? invite all children, uh, teenagers, anybody feeling young this morning to join us up front. Thank you for not abandoning me up here by myself, Madison. It's a little awkward. No, I'm really happy. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, so did y'all get one of these? Did you make it? Can I make this? Get one? Really? Well, I'll read it to you. It says, it says you're invited to First Baptist Church Happy Celebration, Friday, September 2nd at 6.30 p.m. There will be food, bounce houses, games. Y'all didn't get one of these? To the party Friday night? Hmm. Well, I guess that kind of leaves you out, doesn't it? How does that feel? Like, man, why didn't I get invited? I mean, there's a picnic today that everybody's invited to, but I guess this is kind of a special thing. You ever not been invited to a party? Somebody, you find out that somebody's having a party, birthday party, whatever, and there's an invitation over there, and oh, she got an invitation, and why didn't I get an invitation? Kind of hurts, doesn't it? Kind of hurts to not be invited or not be included. In a minute, Beth is going to read our gospel lesson. And in that gospel lesson, um, Jesus teaches us that the people that we need to invite to our parties, to our gatherings, to our lives, they aren't the people who we need to invite because maybe they'll invite us to their party or maybe they'll include us in what they're doing. They're not the ones, we don't need to invite those people who we invite simply because maybe they'll do something for us then. Sometimes when we don't invite people to parties, it's because they don't have as much money as we do. They, you know, they're not going to bring a good present or they're not going to have a party that they're going to invite me to later. So why should I invite them? They don't look like me. They don't act like me. They're kind of weird. I don't want them at my party. But what Jesus teaches us is that if we want our reward here on earth from those other people, go ahead and invite them because that's the only place you're going to get your reward. If you want your reward in heaven, if you want to live like a true Christian lives, then you invite the people that have less. You invite the people who maybe aren't always included. You invite the people who need somebody to just show them a little love every now and then. Because if we do that, then we're living more like Christ would. And we're doing those things that he wants for us. 
So let's say a prayer. Okay. Lord, thank you for inviting us, for opening up your love to each of us, no matter what we wear, where we live, what we look like. Help us to be more like you and to include those who maybe we wouldn't, to open ourselves up just like you do. Amen. By the way, there's no party. <laughs>
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks that you have allowed us to assemble ourselves in your house on this day. Thank you, Lord, for those who made the effort to be in this house of prayer today. And Lord, we give thanks for the opportunity of bringing our tithes and offerings to your house. May they be used in the will of the Lord Jesus. For in Christ's name we pray this and everything. Amen.
Well, it seems fitting that here during these last dog days of summer, when we're experiencing these lovely and hopefully last intense heat waves, that we are continuing with our summer sermon series on the prophets, and we get to Jeremiah. The prophets can sometimes be a bit like summer heat, can't they? <laughs> Let's be honest. Their voices can sometimes weigh us down and make us feel a little sluggish, maybe even a little depressed. Because it's the prophets who seem to be the ones that are always tasked with pointing out the failures and flaws of God's people. They're the ones that hold a mirror up and force those of us who would prefer to assume their reflection looks one way to view the reality of the situation, blemishes and all. And Jeremiah, well, Jeremiah's no exception. His nickname was actually the Weeping Prophet. And so it's no wonder that the Baptist Today Sunday School series is focusing on the Hebrews lectionary readings. <laughs> Those passages are so inspiring. We're talking about the roll call of faith and the hall of fame of biblical heroes, evidence of things unseen and hoped for. And, and that's downright inspirational. And then there's Jeremiah and well, he's somewhat depressing. This is not, by the way, the rise up on wings like eagles passage that we all know and love from Jeremiah. No, and in fact, that is one of the few uplifting parts of Jeremiah, is that verse. But no, we're stuck here in the beginning of Jeremiah that's written during the last days of Judah. The nation of Israel is on its way out. And that's where we find Jeremiah's text. It's where Israel finds itself pretty much literally between a rock and a hard place. They have Egypt on one side and well, as we know, there's no love lost there, right? Egypt remembers as well all that Israel has done against it. And so Egypt is vying to invade and stop the Babylonian advance. And they have Babylon on the other side, who's holding Egypt at bay. And Israel is caught in this tug of war in the middle because Babylon has invaded and assumed control. And they did that in a really demoralizing way. They exiled and deported all of the best most prominent citizens of the kingdom of Israel to Babylon. They created a brain drain as a way to ensure that they would have some total control. And this, this is where Jeremiah is dropped into. Don't you think that it's a bit of an understatement to say life is rough for Israel at this point in time? It is. It's scary. They are realizing that they are in perhaps their last days as a kingdom. And they remember. They remember the glory days, the Israel of old, David's Israel, Solomon's Israel. They remember when they were on top. They remember the temple in all its glory. They remember when the name of Israel inspired fear instead of laughter. They remember when God himself seemed to direct their battles and help assure their victories. Back when they were a great and mighty and powerful nation. And so, according to Jeremiah's passage this morning, it seems as though the Israelites in their panic have been taken in by some shiny new ideas and rituals and ruses that they have seen the Babylonians do. And now they're starting to think that maybe these practices and these false gods, maybe these will help us. 
because it seems like their world as they know it is coming apart at the seams. And so maybe the God their ancestors told them about, well, maybe that God has forgotten them. You can kind of imagine these conversations, can't you? Well, you know, great, great, great grandma always talked about bread falling from heaven. Huh. You mean you actually believe that? Look around you. We're starving. The only bread we're going to get is the bread we make ourselves. I guess, I guess that's right. Where, where is Yahweh now? Maybe he's just a story meant to help children sleep at night. Yeah, if we want to gain our independence and be great again, we'll have to do it on our own. And we better do it fast. Hey, you know, the Babylonians are pretty strong people. Seems to be working out for them all right. And, and you know, they, they worship this god named Baal. And maybe, maybe we should try that. You know, I've, I've, I've always kind of enjoyed that style of worship. And it, it seems to work for them, so, you know. And before you know it, the ways of Moses have been put on a shelf to gather dust as the Israelites in exile and the few left at home attempt to make themselves a great nation once again, even while their numbers dwindle. And so Jeremiah's unpleasant task is to relay God's displeasure to the Israelites for being so quick to turn away from the ways of God to these magic bullet, quick fix routes to success. While the words of prophets like Jeremiah sound harsh and sometimes punishing, the prophets offer us a bird's eye view of life and of faith and allow us to step back and not lose the forest for the trees. Jeremiah's voice is needed both then and now. And while his task is less than pleasant, it's basically to come on the scene and remind Israel and us that even in the most desperate of circumstances, not everything that glitters is gold. You know, like that one ring to rule them all. Had to put in a Lord of the Rings reference. It's shiny and it's precious. And it's false. Not all that glitters is gold. Sometimes it's just fool's gold. Fool's gold is the stuff of legends and moral tales. You all have heard of fool's gold. It's nickname and stories of people falling for it go all the way back to the 16th century. There's a story about an English seaman by the name of Martin Frobisher, who during the second half of the 16th century makes the trip to Canada. And on his second trip there, he finds a mineral that he is sure is gold. So he carries hundreds of tons of the stuff back home to Europe. And dreaming of wealth and power and more gold, he gets even more ships and returns to Canada to mine even more and carry back his gold with him. Only to find out when they begin the smelting process to turn it into these valuable things, it's not gold at all. In fact, it's pretty worthless. It'll become known as a mineral iron pyrite, or in the common vernacular, fool's gold. It's so shiny and so deceptive and so worthless in the end. So disappointing. It lures the prospector with dreams of wealth and greatness, 
Dreams of all that power and prestige and, and hitting the mother load all float through your mind and your imagination, only to find out in the end it's a farce. The Israelites were falling for fool's gold. And God, through the tearful voice of Jeremiah, is reminding them of what the real thing looks like. Living water, living presence during trials, abundance in times of scarcity, cisterns that don't leak. And lest we get a bit too sure of ourselves, perhaps we too are living in a fool's gold rush. The temptation is there to succumb to the quest for greatness, is it not? But the way of Jesus calls us not to be great, but to be good. And so often the human desire for greatness comes at the cost of our goodness. Look around in our culture today, and it won't take you long to see that perhaps we too are exhausted by trying to refill cisterns that are in actuality cracked and leaking. We too can become consumed with a desire to be great, to be significant, to be powerful, And in so doing, we can lose sight of the call of Christ to be good. Look at the stories coming out of the Olympics about a couple athletes that may have been so focused on being great athletes that they forgot how to be good people. Or look at our political climate. We're inundated with messages and promises and advertisements about how this politician or this party or this measure or this bill will help ensure and protect and increase our greatness and our significance. But perhaps in all of that, we're forgetting how to be good people, how to listen and really see those who are different than us or disagree with us. And unfortunately, the church, God's people, are not immune to occasionally chasing greatness and fool's gold either. If we just had this program or this offering or these people or fill in the blank, then we'd be successful we'd be great. There are so many articles floating around out there right now about the church's temptation to equate size with greatness, with success. But the beauty of scripture is such that by biblical standards, church is and has always been by definition a small group of people doing faith together in faithful community. No matter where or in what era they find themselves. Jeremiah and so many other biblical voices, especially that of Jesus, remind us that the pursuit of greatness often comes at the expense of our goodness. And maybe Jeremiah's words can remind us, too, of the bigger picture, of a calling that moves beyond greatness and bigness and significance and elusive definitions of success that always drive us to want more. In youth on Wednesday nights, we've been looking at what we're calling neglected voices in Scripture. And these these characters are those whose stories are probably not often told. They're not characters that parted the Red Sea or had a blinding light conversion experience or even sat at the feet of Jesus themselves or have big crowds following them. 
But nevertheless, they had a part to play in God's story. And sometimes their role wound up having results that were beyond what they could have ever imagined. Characters like Barnabas, who was the only one willing to give the newly converted Saul a chance long before he became the biggest missionary in Christian history. Characters who may never be described as great, but who in small and sometimes seemingly insignificant ways change the world around them. Often by following Christ's call to be good. My dad is like that. That's who I always think of when I think of goodness. He's a really brilliant guy. You might have gotten to meet him a couple times. And he could have pursued greatness. But he believes wholeheartedly in his calling to be a soccer coach. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what he did and does. <laughs> And as you can imagine, being a soccer coach is not the most lucrative job in the world. And so he worked as a janitor at one of the local elementary schools by day so that on the evenings and weekends, he could offer free soccer clinics to Hispanic youth in the Chicagoland area. And so that he could stay true to his call to start a soccer club that's based on positive coaching and not on winning at all costs. He's never gonna go down in the history books as great or significant or powerful. He's never gonna make the news. And yet, two weeks ago, he and my mom attended yet another wedding of a young lady that my dad coached 15 years ago. 15 years have passed since she played on one of his teams and he was still invited to her wedding and mentioned in the toast because he stayed in touch with them over all this time. My dad will tell you that he continually had to and has to fight against the desire to be great. And that it's really humbling to be a janitor in an elementary school. But he wouldn't trade it for anything. And while it seems like kicking a ball around with some kids on a field that he has made and leveled himself isn't super significant. I have a feeling that a lot of those kids, it's changed their world. In a world that strives for greatness and pushes us to be significant and powerful and prestigious and search for renown and bigger and better, how can we be true to God's call to be good, righteous people. Jesus gives us a little hint of that in the gospel lesson today. We have to learn how to really see our neighbors, how to humbly invite all those around us to the table, not so that we can have a place of honor, but because we genuinely believe that at God's table, there is a seat for everyone. Love your neighbor is not a metaphor. It's a commandment to love the next person we encounter as much as and as well as we happen to love ourselves. So maybe church is about authentically doing life and faith with your neighbors. Or as Jeremiah put it, turning back to the God who provides living water rather than continuing to fill leaky cisterns or seeking after fool's gold. 
May we as a community that is faithfully dedicated to living out the call of Christ, to be humble and good, may we see our neighbors. May we remember that we need them and they need us. And may we remember that sometimes the things that may seem to be the most ordinary, the most insignificant, well, they wind up being sacraments, vessels that convey the holy, cisterns of living water that convey the very grace and presence of God. The thank you card, the hug, the phone call, the hospital visit, the casserole dish, ordinary insignificant things that are so much more than that. So who will you be? What will you seek after? Who needs you not to be powerful and great, but to be good? to be faithful to the calling of Christ, to be humble and seek out those who need us to truly see them. As the poet William Blake so beautifully penned, I sought my soul, but my soul I could not see. I sought my God, but my God eluded me. I sought my neighbor and I found all three. And I think that if William Blake were a Baptist, I imagine he'd have added one more line to that poem. And I took her casserole dish as she grieved and healed. And it tasted like communion. Amen. It's our tradition here at First Baptist that when a word is offered, an invitation is extended. So you are invited in this moment as we sing together to pray and to ponder and then to go from this place and seek out your neighbor. Because in so doing, you just might glimpse the kingdom of God. Won't you stand and sing with us?
before we sing together our benediction that we've sung all summer, hear these familiar words of blessing. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Creator, and as you go, remember, in the goodness of God you were born into this world. By the grace of God you have been kept all the day long, even until this very hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, and maybe even a casserole, you and we, we're being redeemed. Amen.